Hey, good morning, everybody. How are you doing today? Good to have you. Thanks for being here. Some Sunday, we're going to have Nick translate what I say, all right, into the English vernacular. We love having him up here. Uh, hey, uh, it's Christmas time, right? And uh, nothing speaks Christmas like talking about hurricanes. And uh, so I just want to give you a little insights about hurricanes and where hurricane names came from. It used to be back in the day, they would name hurricanes after uh, the location that that hurricane hit. Uh, maybe it was a holiday that was close to the hurricane. Sometimes they just gave it a, a number. Well, uh, back in the World War II, uh, the Air Force and Navy meteorologists, they got together and said, we, gotta, we can do better than this. And so they decided, we're going to give hurricanes names. And so they did. They gave them the names of their wives and girlfriends friends. Can you imagine that conversation going home? Hey, hun, there's this crazy, wacky hurricane that's getting ready to hit. And guess what? We named it after you, right? That didn't go over very well, uh, of course. And uh, so in about 1953, uh, the U.S. Weather Bureau got together and said, all right, we need to fix this. We need to change this. You know, people don't really like hurricanes being named directly after them. And so they said, we're going to make a list. And so they made a list and it was female names, alphabetical order at the beginning of the year. And then as the storms would hit, they would give that storm that particular name. Times changed. Uh, There's some political pressure that came their way. And so the U.S. Bureau, Weather Bureau, said, well, okay, we need to make one more adjustment here. And so they did what we're familiar with now, right? They, they said, okay, we're going to have alternating names, male, female. We're going to put these together at the beginning of the year. And as these storms hit, we're going to give them that particular name. And, and again, that's what we're used to to this day. But, but if you, th you think about the names of hurricanes, and if I were to say Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Sandy, Hurricane Andrew, Hurricane Inn. Like in our minds, if we were alive, you know exactly what that hurricane was like. Maybe you even lived through it yourself. You remember what it was like when it hit. You remember the aftermath from it, right? And so those, those names have given it this identity to even to this day, years later, we still remember everything about that particular hurricane. You and I, we go through these storms in our lives, and we probably have these storms that we've named ourselves. The dirty divorce, the financial fiasco. And in your mind, you've given that moment in time in your life, you've given it that name, you've given that storm your name because it has, it has brought about this, this reminder to you of that time that was hard and that was tough. And, and maybe, maybe you're still kind of dealing with it even to this day because of the storm that hit in your life. Well, if I can give you some words of encouragement this morning when it comes to these storms that we have, it's this. You're either coming out of a storm, in the midst of a storm, or there's a storm on the horizon. That's really encouraging, isn't it? But it's true. Think about it. You've either gone through, and, and if you've got a little age on it, you, you've been through storms in your life. And, and maybe for some of us right now, we are in the midst of a storm right now at this moment. <laughs> but I hate to tell you that from now to the day, day that you are gone from this world, there's going to be more storms that will come your way. And so how do we deal with them? How do we deal with these storms that come? How do we deal with the storms that, that have been? How do we deal with the storms that we're in right now? We're going to spend our time today as we continue this series called God With Us. We're going to talk about how we deal with the storms that are in our life. And we're going to do it by looking at a book in the Bible that, again, when you think about Christmas, you, you think about this book of the Bible, the book of Acts, okay? So we're going to spend our time this morning in the book of Acts. That was a joke. There's nothing really a whole lot in there about the birth of Jesus, but... There's some important stuff in there that uh, we're going to focus on today. Uh, if you're familiar with the book of Acts, you know that uh, at the very beginning of it, we, we have Jesus, and Jesus is uh, with his followers, and he's like, hey, I'm getting ready to leave and go to heaven, and here's a few things that you need to understand. Here's a few things that you need to do. And then Jesus is gone. And then the rest of the book of Acts is about the beginning of this thing we call the church. It's about the this, uh, experiences that these people have as they start this church and as they're spreading the good news of Jesus to the world. And so that's what we have in the book of Acts. Now, part of the book of Acts, actually a, a big part of it, is the focus on this one guy, a guy named Paul. 
And so we read about Paul's experiences. We read about what Paul goes through uh, in his experiences as he, as he continues to spread the good news of Jesus throughout uh, the places that he visits. Well, when we look at the end of the book of Acts, we find that Paul is in prison. Well, how did he get into prison? Around 57 AD, uh, Paul is in Jerusalem. Uh, he's hanging out with the Jerusalem church, with the Christians that are there. And he's, he's telling them about where he's been. He's telling them about his experiences and his stories. And then they're kind of sharing with him, like, hey, here's what we're experiencing here. And uh, giving him some theological uh, leanings to kind of think through. Well, as he's there in Jerusalem, hanging out with this group of people, there's this other group that has been to some of the places that Paul has started churches. They come into town. And so they start to tell the Jewish people that are there, they're like, hey, Paul has been talking terribly about your faith. He's been talking terribly about Judaism and, and what we believe. And, and these people weren't followers of Jesus. And so the Jewish people are there, they get upset. They're like, well, why is Paul doing this? And so they decide, well, we need to get rid of Paul. So they go to Paul, they, they start to beat him up. They are really trying to kill him. These riots began. The Roman soldiers jump in, partly to save Paul, but mostly that they don't want their city to be torn apart because they're in charge of this. And if this word gets back to Rome, they could be in big trouble. And so they come in, they save Paul. They hear all these rumors that are lies that are being told, but they believe them. And so they label him an insurrectionist. And so they arrest Paul. Well, what we find next, you've got a religious trial that takes place. You've got some government trials that take place. And this lasts for a while. And then at 60 AD, Paul's like, I'm kind of done with this. Uh, I'm going to appeal this, these trials. I'm going to appeal the Senate to Caesar. And because he was a Roman citizen, he had the ability to do that. And they're like, all right, well, you've, you've asked if you could do this. So we're going to take you to Caesar. Back in those days, um, to move prisoners, you didn't have Con Air, right? You didn't have Con Air with Nicolas Cage on there to save you just in case things go bad. You, you had to travel by boat. And so what they would do, they, they didn't have like prisoner ships uh, mostly. They, what they would do is they'd have cargo ships that were traveling from one port to another, mostly go to Rome. So we have this cargo ship that's full of corn. They're taking it to Rome because the people need that grain. And, uh, and so they throw prisoners on there just like, hey, you go ahead and you ride with them with, of course, some soldiers and the sailors that are on the ship. And so that's what we, where we end up today. And um, as we read through what we're going to read through here in the book of Acts, uh, we're going to find that uh, the, the pronouns that are used are we. Um, the reason is the person who wrote, Luke, uh, wrote Acts is Luke. And Luke is on this boat with Paul and one other guy. They're on this boat together heading to Rome. And then trouble starts to brew in Acts chapter 27, starting with verse 13, here's what it says. It says, when a light wind began blowing from the south, the sailors thought they could make it. So they pulled up anchor and sailed close to the shore of Crete. But the weather changed abruptly, and a wind of typhoon strength called a northeaster burst across the island and blew us out to sea. The sailors couldn't turn their ship into the wind, so they gave up and let it run before the gale. We sailed along the shelter side of a small island named Cauda, where with great difficulty we hoisted aboard the lifeboat being towed behind us. Then the sailors bound ropes around the hull of the ship to strengthen it. They were afraid of being driven across to the sandbars of Syrtis off the African coast, so they lowered the sea anchor to slow the ship and were driven before the wind. The next day, as gale force winds continued to batter the ship, the crew began throwing the cargo overboard. The following day, they, took e they even took some of the ship's gear and threw it overboard. You ever watch those uh, videos for the cruise line ships when a storm hits? Maybe you've experienced this before in your life. And uh, the boat's listing you know, back and forth. The, the waves are huge. The storm's raging. And you watch as furniture moves from one side all the way to the other and then back again. But we don't just see furniture because they usually have everybody in the same spot in this big main area. And we see people sliding across uh, this area or the floor. Uh, we, we see people falling. We hear them screaming and crying, puking, right? Because of everything that they're experiencing there on that ship. I kind of imagine it was close to that. Except way worse, right? Like 110 times worse because the boat they're in is not cruise line type size. 
It's a lot smaller. But, but I imagine they're screaming and crying and yelling and trying to figure things out. And they're probably not feeling too well. I mean, they're experiencing this. But yet here we have these, these knowledgeable and trained sailors that are taking them. And they're on this boat. And they're getting to the place of, I think we're going to sink. So they begin to think, how do, we, how do we deal with this? How do we survive? How, how do we make it? Because, you know, we don't want to die. And so you've got this, this crazy event that's happening. Look at verse 20. The terrible storm raged for many days, blotting out the sun and the stars until at last all hope was gone. In June 2014, our family was, um, the end of June, heading to the, the weekend of July 4th. Our family was down at the Outer Banks for a week of vacation. Our family members have a house there and it's oceanfront. So we were, we were there just to relax and, and breathe and, and get away from life and have some family time. Well, uh, the week that we headed down there, there was a tropical storm brewing off the coast of Florida and decided to come up the coast, the eastern coast there, uh, turned into a Cat 1 storm. And uh, so we were like, hey, do we need to leave? They're like, no, we've, we've been through Cat 1 storms before. It's not that big a deal. We'll be fine. We'll put up the hurricane shutters. Everything's going to be great. And we're like, okay, we trust you in this. My mom's calling, like, get out of there now. And we're like, we're good. Um, but then that evening that it hit or was getting ready to hit the water was really warm and it <laughs> it grew into a cat two storm and it was not a fun night if you've ever been through that before it was not a fun night but we survived the house survived we're all still here right but the thing that about it that I still remember to this day was my brother-in-law my brother-in-law is in incredible shape takes care of himself but he loves to surf and he's kind of been all over the place to surf and so that afternoon, the storm is supposed to hit. He looks out at the, the waves there on the Outer Banks. He's like, this is some of the best surfing weather there is. Puts on his wetsuit, grabs his board, heads out. I go and set up on the, the highest uh, porch that's there. And, and I just watch him for an hour. And for one hour, he tries and tries and tries to fight against the storm. He's doing everything he can to get out. He, he moves positions. He, he swims a little harder. He does everything he can. He's just trying to get beyond that first swell so he can get out to where the real waves are. And for an hour, for an hour, using all his effort, he never could get beyond. He never got out there to surf. Now why was that? Well, the storm was pushing him back. The storm was fighting against all his efforts. We go back to this passage here. We have this experienced sailing crew. They're fighting against the storm. And maybe like my brother-in-law, they, they had some hope, right? They, they had some hope that they could, they could get out there and they could save themselves. and They could save their boat. But they tried and tried and the storm is fighting against them. The storm is pushing them and keeping them to this place where they're just, they're just at a place saying, hey, I, I, we have given up all hope of winning. And not to mention, as we read verse 20 here, they're lost. They, they don't know where they are. They, 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 uh, in those days, you would, uh, if you were a sailor, you tried to stay close to the land because you knew the land. And as, as much as you could see the land, then you were safe. But they couldn't see the land anymore. They'd been blown out to sea. Not, not only that, but as we read here, you can't see the sun. They can't see the stars. The storm has raged for days. So again, sailors use the sun and the stars to help them figure out where they are. But none of that's visible to them. They were lost. And because they're lost, Probably because their ship is breaking apart. They're throwing all this stuff off. They get to the place of just saying, we've tried and tried and tried and we cannot beat the storm. And so as we read here, Luke says, all hope was gone. How many people do you know in your life where the storm has caused them to lose hope? The storm has hit and they've tried everything that they know to get through it. They've worked to find calm. They've worked to find solutions. But that storm, it rages. Maybe it rages for days, weeks, sometimes months, even years. And in their mind, they're like, sometime this thing has got to stop, but it hasn't stopped and it hasn't let up and it's not ending. And so they've gotten to this place of saying, hey, I'm, I'm going to give up all my hope. Let's think about this another way. How many times have you been through a storm 
where you've tried and tried to find a solution. You've tried and tried to find calm and you've, you've fought against the storm as much as you could and yet it continues to rage and maybe it's raged for days or weeks. Maybe for some of us, months, years. And we thought maybe it was going to get easier. And maybe we weren't going to have to deal with this anymore. And yet, yet here you are. You've gotten to this place where you've given up hope. But that's what happens, right? The storms hit and we try and try to find our way through the storms. And sometimes they can feel like nothing's working. It can feel like we are helpless, we are lost, and, and all we're doing is fighting against the storm. And we give up. And we give up hope. Look at verse 21. No one had eaten for a long time. Finally, Paul called the crew together and said, Men, you should have listened to me in the first place and not left Crete. You would have avoided all this damage and loss. Now, this is actually an interesting statement that Paul makes here. And uh, the question is, where is this coming from? And it's actually coming from verse 10. Go back to verse 10. Here's what Paul says to the same group. He says, men, I believe there's trouble ahead if we go on. Shipwreck, loss of cargo, and danger to our lives as well. Now, I, I don't know. I mean, are Paul's knees hurting? You know those people? Like, oh, my knee hurts. There must be rains coming in the next 24 hours. You know those people? Oh, my, my bones are hurting. It's going to be a snowstorm here in five minutes. And it's, I don't know, 25% of the time that actually happens. Um, that's not what's happening with Paul. He doesn't feel like his bones creaking and having pain. Paul has this unique connection with, with God. And so Paul understands from God. God is like, hey, you need to tell this group, like, stay where you are. Don't, don't go anywhere. Stay in this harbor. Just, just, just stay here. Ride this out for now. And then a little bit later on, you can head off on this trip. Now, I'm sure this group of guys, these sailors, are looking at Paul and like, you know, what do you do for a living? You're a pastor. We, we heard you guys only work one day a week. So, I mean, what do you guys know, right? And so that, maybe that's what, what they're thinking about Paul. But, but here's Paul. Paul has given them this advice that it's going to be a rough ride and no one listens. Because they believe or don't think Paul knows what he's talking about. The storms that we face in our life can come from many different places. Some come out of nowhere, right? They just happen. Uh, Some come out of the relationships that we have with other people. But often the storms that we face, they come from the actions and decisions that we make in our own life. You use uh, dating as an example, because my guess is, you know, everybody in here has been on a date at least one time in their, their life. And, and maybe at some point in time, there was this one person you dated and, and people were giving you advice about that person, right? Maybe your best friend said, you know, this dude you're dating is nothing but trouble. And, and then your mom jumps in and she's like, you need to run away from this guy because this isn't going to end up well. And, and your fortune cookie's like, what are you thinking? <laughs> Winning numbers, by the way, are, you know, that gives you the winning numbers there. And so we get to this place and, and we, we hear all of this and, and we take this advice. And how do we so often respond? Hey, thanks, but I got this. Hey, I appreciate your insights, but uh, I, I know what I'm doing. And that decision that we make, that action that we take, even when we get really good advice, really good insights, here's what we do. We go ahead and do what we want to do because we think, hey, I'm going to change him. Hey, I'm going to change her. And so we, we just go about our business, but we don't listen to the advice and the storm hits. And the relationship is broken. The relationship is messy. And in our minds, we're like, what What have I got myself into? And and we get to a place where we lose all hope. Even with getting input and advice from others. And so we go back and we we see what we we have here with Paul. And he says, you should have listened to me. Yeah, I only work one day a week, but I got, you know, a unique connection here. I can help you out. I gave you some really good advice. Look where we're at. And for some of us, that's how we respond when we give advice to other people and they don't listen, isn't it? We give them grief. We make them feel worse. I mean, they're already going through a storm. We're just kind of adding on to it. 
Paul does say, hey, I told you what you should have done. But, look at verse 22. But take courage. Paul doesn't just stay at this place of saying, I told you so. Paul's like, hey, I gave you some advice. You didn't take it. Here we are, but take courage. That word Paul uses here for courage in the Greek means do not be anxious. Do not be anxious. How, how many of us, when we come to this storm in our life, we become anxious? We're, we're, we're like the sailors on, on this boat. We're lost. We don't know which way to turn, which way to go, which way is up in our anxiousness. It just begins to take over us. But that's not what we want, right? We want the storm to go away. We want things to be back to normal. We want to we move on. But the storm, ah, man, it's still raging. It's still fighting against us and we're stuck. And that anxiousness we feel, it turns into depression. It turns into anger. It turns into bitterness. And we end up losing all hope. So maybe for you and for me, the thing that we need to take from what Paul talks about here are those first three words, right? But take courage. Whether your storm is self-imposed, whether it's because of relationships that you've been in, or it shows up out of nowhere, maybe those three words are the words we need to hold on to. But take courage. Because here's the deal. You've already been through a storm. You're in the midst of a storm, or there's a storm coming up over the horizon. And it could be, instead of trying to fight through it, trying to battle our way against this storm, look, most of the time, we're not going to win that battle at all. And we're going to lose hope. But Paul says, but take courage. Do not lose your faith in the midst of the storms. Look at verse 22, or back to 22. But take courage. None of you will lose your lives, even though the ship will go down. He gives the good news first. Hey, you're not going to die. The bad news comes second. Hey, but, you know, the ship's going to sink. For last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me. And he said, don't be afraid. Paul, for you will surely stand trial before Caesar. What's more, God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. So take courage, for I believe God. So Paul tells everybody on this ship, as they're struggling, trying to think about how their death is going to come about, he says, hey, here's the deal. Let me, let me help you out. Take courage. But, but let me tell you why I have this courage. Hey, last night I had an angel of God, a God I serve, a God I love, a God that I, I do everything I can for, sent this angel to me, and the angel told me everything's going to be fine. Yeah, the boat's going to sink, but nobody is going to die. I read that part of the story here, and we don't see this um, said or written in this passage, but I think the thing that I gather every time I see this part of this is that what Paul is saying is saying, hey, I have spent time in prayer. I've spent time in prayer. I mean, imagine again, he's a pastor. He works one day a week, right? And he's got his buddies that are there with him. But then you got the sailing crew and they know what they're doing. They, they know they're trained. They, they've got nods. They've got all this stuff. And here's Paul and he's got Luke and he's got this other guy. And they're like, we don't know what to do. I'm guessing those three people got together and they started to pray. And they're praying for God. God, help us through this storm. God, help us in this moment. God, guide us, lead us, save us, whatever you can do. God, what do you see happening here for us? And, and in that, that angel shows up to say, hey, God's got you covered. Maybe for us, instead of complaining, getting angry, letting anxiousness take over during our storms, what if we actually spent more time praying because that's not where we tend to go right we tend to complain more we, we tend to get caught up in everything that's happening and we forget about the prayer we might say one prayer and then we're done could be that we just need to spend more time in prayer praying for God to help us to strengthen us and to guide us 
so that we can be like Paul. So in the end, we can say, hey, I believe God. I trust God. I have faith in God. Something good is going to come out of this storm. Now, maybe for you, it's easy to read the story. You read the story, you hear it today, and you're thinking, well, well, Paul, man, that guy, that was a really bad event in his life. But that guy, I mean, that's just one thing, right? He's, he's, he's never really experienced stuff. He's not ever experienced anything like I have. I've had storm after storm after storm in my life. But if you know a little bit about Paul, you know that's not true. In fact, in 2 Corinthians, let me read to you some of the Paul, things Paul faced. Chapter 11. Here's what Paul says. I have worked harder, been put in prison more often, been whipped times without number, and faced death again and again. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. I've traveled on many long journeys. I have faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I have faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I have faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. And I have faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. I have worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I have been hungry and thirsty and have often gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. And, and this is just one writing where Paul writes this. He writes this in other places about the things that he has gone through in his life. Paul has experienced many different storms, but he learned something through those experiences. And sometimes when we go through those storms, we learn from those too. And hopefully it's what, what Paul learns. Because Paul actually shares something with his apprentice. He shares something with a guy named Timothy, a student of his. And we see this in 2 Timothy 4. This is how Paul made it through all that tough times, those storms. He says, the first time I was brought before the judge, no one came with me. Everyone abandoned me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood with me and gave me strength so that I might preach the good news in its entirety for all the Gentiles to hear. And he rescued me from certain death. See what Paul talks about here. I mean, this is not some idea that Paul is writing about that just kind of came to his mind one day. Like, oh, you know what? Maybe God's with us. Maybe God strengthens us. It wasn't some blog post that he read. and He's like, man, that was really good. I'm going to share that with everybody I know. I'm going to share that with Timothy. And maybe Timothy can learn something from that. Paul wasn't watching some TikTok video of a 15-year-old who thinks they've got theology all figured out. and like, oh, that was really good. I want to, I want to make sure the people that are listening to me, and Timothy, my student, he hears this. This doesn't come from those areas. This comes from Paul's experiences in his life. He understands what it means to survive the storms he faced. He, he understood wh what it was going to mean for the storms that he was in the midst of. He, he knew what it was going to take to survive the storms to come. A and he, he shares that right here, doesn't he? He says, God, every single time, was by my side during the storms. And God strengthen me when those storms were happening. Why? God was right there. It's like Sean talked about last week. If you were here, you know, God whispers. And why does God whisper? Because God is right there beside us. Now, my hope is, unlike what Paul writes here in Timothy, that, um, that there are others by your side when the storms come. That's why we talk a lot here of the journey about groups. Uh, we understand that being in a community together, smaller communities than what we experience here, so important to dealing with the, the storms that we face in, in our lives. And so that's why we say, hey, get into a group or even be on a ministry team because they've got coaches and those ministry teams, those coaches are supposed to help and take care of you so that we don't feel abandoned when those tough times do come. Now, we are all human. And sometimes that may not happen. But you know what your job is to do? If you're in that, you're like, hey, you're my leader. You're the person who oversees us. I really need you right now during this storm. Because we're a follower of Christ. That's what we're called to do. 
We're called to be there when people are going through storms in our life. And then when we're experiencing storms, those people are to be there in our life too. And so hopefully we never experience that abandonment like, like Paul does here. And so maybe though, maybe you've been abandoned by people. And if so, just remember God is with you. That God is right there by your side giving you the strength that you need. But then others of you may be saying, hey, <laughs> I hear that, but I feel abandoned by God. Because when the storms come, one of the first things that we do is that we question God. We blame God. God, where were you when this happened? God, why aren't you changing this outcome right now? God, why, why have you allowed this to take place in, in my life? And so we, we throw out all these questions to God when these storms show up. And, and yeah, we look at the, the life of Paul here and the storms he faced. And for him, there was that one truth that he lived by. That God was always there for him. That no matter what he was facing in his life, and I'm going to go on a limb here and say Paul has probably faced or probably faced more terrible things than most of us combined. And yet he faces it on a daily basis. And, and, and instead of giving up, instead of losing hope, he understands that God is always with him. No matter how strong those storms may be. And maybe that's the reminder we need for us today. That when those storms hit, when those storms are raging, that God's with us, that God's by our side, that God has never left us, and that God is there to give us strength. So you and I never lose hope. If there's one statement that maybe can leave with you today that I believe can help all of us in those storms. It's this, never let the presence of a storm cause you to doubt the presence of God. Never let the presence of a storm cause you to doubt the presence of God. And maybe you need that during the Christmas season. Because I, I know Christmas, uh, it, it, can, it can affect us and the storms that we have. Because for some of us, uh, Christmas brings up the storms from our past. And, and we haven't really fully dealt with that. Maybe there's an aftermath there. And we struggle. We struggle with that past. And here's Christmas time. And, and those doubts start to come. And we're feeling like we're abandoned by others. We're abandoned by God. Maybe we've given up hope. But for others of us, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of family time getting ready to happen here in the next couple of weeks. And you know with your family, when they get together, they create their own weather systems, right? <laughs> they create their own storms, and you kind of get stuck in the middle of it, and you're like, oh, my goodness. And so maybe for you, it's, it's just being reminded, hey, but take courage. Hey, God's with me, e even, though, e even though the storms that are being created right here. Or maybe for you, Christmas this year opens up a door to a storm that's on the horizon. Something you hadn't thought about, something you weren't prepared for. And, and that storm's on, on its way. And, and, and you're trying to figure out, well, what would I do if that happens? And maybe Christmas brings that about. But if that does take place, hold on to this thought. Never let the presence of a storm cause you to doubt the presence of God. As I think about that statement and trying to live that out in my life and hopefully in your life too, it takes me back to another angel who says these words to Joseph in Matthew 1, 23. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. I hope that this series is a reminder to us, especially to those of us that say we follow Jesus, that, that there is a God that is there with us in the valleys, that there is a God that is with us in the wilderness, that there is a God who is with us and beside us when the storms of life hit. 
And maybe in those moments, in those times, in those days, weeks, months, years, we can find the courage we need to face them because of who God is. And we're reminded of that through God sending Jesus to this earth. This incredible gift that is for you and for me to remind us we are unconditionally loved. For, for God to be able to say, hey, look, I have sent my son. And oh, by the way, that means I am with you through all eternity. I hope this series can be a reminder to us that God is always present. And God is right beside us. As we think about the storms in our life and the things that we face, there's a couple of next steps I would share with you. First one is maybe you're at this place in your life where you feel like you are lost. You're, you're, you're wandering around. You're out on the sea. The storms are raging. You don't know what to do. And, and maybe you're asking questions about Jesus. Maybe for you it's time to say, hey, God, I'm going to take courage. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to have faith in you. I'm going to believe in you to lead me in my life. And so maybe for you, that your spiritual journey today is, is baptism. And man, we would love to talk to you about that. Next Sunday, we are doing a baptism service during our, our services. We've got, if we've got one person, great. If we've got 25 people, that's great. We, we just want to see people take that step. And maybe that's where you are. Maybe for you, you've got to say, now it's time for me to take courage. And to take this important step in my spiritual journey. If you have questions about that, you want to talk about that, there's a connection card in front of you. You can fill that out and give that to the people in our guest tent. You can take a picture of that QR code. You can fill out the connection card that's on there. And we will, we will um, connect with you this week. <laughs> one thing you got to do, you got to connect back with us, all right? I sent a bunch of emails out last week and I think I heard from one person. So respond back because we, we want to help you take that step in, in your life and we'd love to talk you through that. So maybe that's the place for you. Maybe for others, you are in the midst of a storm right now and you are lost and you're being tossed all over the place and you don't know what to do. Our prayer team, they're going to be up here at the end of our service. Man, they would love to pray over you and the storm you're in. So as we finish up today, make sure you take the time to do that. And then lastly, I would say counseling. Uh, we talk about this a lot, uh, Safe Harbor Christian Counseling. You can email us off at the journeynova.org. Um, do me a favor. Some of you have told me before, like, hey, we've contacted them. We didn't get anywhere. Don't do that, okay? Contact us. Let us be the mediator between them and you. And it's so much easier to do that. Uh, if you're worried that somebody's going to know, there's only two people that know. One's me. And the other one, she did Intel for a long time. So she's, she's safe, totally safe. Um, but let us take care of that for you. Let us connect with, with them and, and help you out with that. Somebody told me that they had an issue before. They're, they're, they're busy, but they've got plenty of counselors, and we would love to get you connected with them. So please, please don't let the storm continue to rage. Maybe it's your aftermath. You still haven't dealt with it. Man, sometimes you need that, that outside person to walk you through those steps you need to take in your storm. Whatever it may be for you, wherever you may be in your life, may we always remember that God is with us. And as we talk about that, that statement again, maybe this is the thing that we take with us. Never let the presence of a storm cause you to doubt the presence of God.